time to start. Okay, so we are on P chapter 35, okay? But first I kind of want to review where we are from last time. Okay, so I'm going to kind of flip the camera around real quick here. So they are in Baltimore because their Mr. Pinkerton's detective agency was hired to take a look at the railroad lines um, in case they were getting destroyed. Right now, President or Abraham Lincoln is on his way to the White House to become the president. And remember, what's important here is that Baltimore aligns with the South. There are those secessionists. Oops, looks like I forgot to finish writing the word because I needed to look at how to spell it correctly. Um, they are playing Mrs. Barley and Miss Matilda Maddox. And the last part is, these are the things we've known so far. We've met Edwin and John Wilkes Booth that are theater actors that they met when they were hanging out with a bunch of rebels. And then there's something about a barber named Ferrandini. Okay. Um, Aunt Kitty wrote a note to Mr. Pinkerton that said nuts to Philadelphia and Harrisburg. And then we also got a clue from Gemma about where the maple tree might be. And it was that street name clue. Okay, so today's chapter is called In Which Aunt Kitty Takes Us to Another City and I Take Off to Find the Maple Tree. So I'm guessing the other city they're going to is Philadelphia. Our days in Baltimore were busy with socializing and eavesdropping, not to mention dressing up in our fine gowns. But before long, Aunt Kitty whisked us off to the nearest train depot and we boarded a locomotive for New York City. I, I hear the theater shows there are grand, I said with a cool voice, trying not to reveal my excitement of exploring a big city. I've saved up a bit of money for adventuring. Perhaps we could attend a comedy to lift the spirits. Aunt Kitty said this was no time for make-believe when we had such a dangerous case unfolding before us. That kept me on the edge of my seat the whole ride north to New York. Did this have anything to do with nuts? as Aunt Kitty had written, or with the razor-wielding barber in the Baltimore Hotel. <clears throat> had that barber moved to New York? Was that city full of angry secessionists too? But how, when it wasn't a southern state? I had too many questions swirling in my head to ask my aunt, knowing how short on patience she was with me most days. I tried to figure things out on my own, paying close attention as Aunt Kitty kept appointments with important-looking businessmen at all hours of the day and night. Their conversations hushed and, t hushed and tense. She passed them letters. They passed her ones right back. There was a lot of whispering and telegraphing and general secretiveness, the details of which even my sensitive ears could not take in. You're a strange woman, Mrs. Barley, one of them told Aunt Kitty in frustration one morning. He wanted her to disclose more information, so I leaned my body closer towards their chairs at the windows in the hopes of overhearing some nugget that would help me make sense of this latest case. But Aunt Kitty refused to divulge any of Mr. Pinkerton's secrets. Once we retired to our hotel room, Aunt Kitty rushed to her pen and paper and began secretively writing a new message. I peered over her shoulder. Plums. The operation is heating up in Baltimore. She wrote quickly, dripping her pen, quickly dripping her pen into the blue black ink, and I wondered who Plums was. Mr. Pinkerton? When she spied me behind her, I made a point to unfurl my newspaper with a noisy flip of my wrists and head for the fireplace to read. I was caught up with the real news of the day Mr. Lincoln's journey across the countryside into Washington. The newspaper said he would raise the flag over Independence Hall this week in Philadelphia, then journey on to the Pennsylvania capital in. Harrisburg. Wait, didn't the last clue say nuts to Philadelphia and Harrisburg? Those were to be his final steps before making his way down to Baltimore and onto the White House in Washington. The paper even printed his train schedule. I remember the rebels talking about how he better never get off the train here or something like that. They didn't seem very thrilled about having him get to Baltimore. Wait a minute. Harrisburg and Philadelphia. Those were the cities Aunt Kitty had mentioned in one of her earlier messages. In Baltimore, we'd spent a good long while in that cesspool. Our work here in New York is completed, Matilda, Aunt Kitty announced abruptly the next afternoon. I was seated in the hotel restaurant just about to sink my teeth into a buttery roasted goose. We've met with the gentleman Mr. Pinkerton wanted us to meet. The information we needed is obtained. I won't tell you more on that. Now grab your bag and get moving. We've got to catch the next train to Philadelphia. We were heading to Philadelphia. Thoughts began swirling in my mind like fireflies in a mason jar. Similarly, I'd read about Philadelphia in Gemma's letter. 
I got up from the table in a hurry, straightening my bonnet and grabbing my black knit bag. Maybe I was getting used to being a detective's assistant and always on the move because I didn't even bother waiting around for the hotel dessert. And it would have been my first time to taste iced cream. Notice back then they called it iced cream. Just about an hour later, with our rail car rocking gently from side to side, we rolled south from New York towards the city of Philadelphia. I pulled out my cigar box and rifled through its contents to find Gemma's Christmas letter. Unfolding the pages, I ignored my aunt's roving eye and read openly. With our secret code, Gemma's letter would make about as much sense to Aunt Kitty as her telegraphs were making to me. I have too much to do in Philadelphia to keep my eyes on you, Matilda, she announced quietly, darting looks at passengers around us to make sure nobody was listening. So I want you to stay put at the train station until I call for you. Please don't make me sit still, I began, making sure to keep from whining. Aunt Kitty could handle an argument, but the second a tinge of fussiness colored my voice, she went deaf. I didn't get to see any in New York City, and it's not healthy to stay cooped up inside. Please allow me to meander a bit and explore the sights. Philadelphia is a city rich in historical significance. For a beat or two, Aunt Kitty squinted at me with a look of doubt. I think she was trying to measure if I really had a lick of interest in sites of historical significance, or if I was sassing her. Thankfully, she did not have the time or the patience to talk it through. Here are a few dimes. If the circumstances were different, I wouldn't allow your girl your age to wander off, she said, sizing me up with a long stare. Make sure you stay fed and stay safe. I want you back at the train station on time, not a minute late. Do you understand? I promised up and down that I'd buy a proper meal and not wander off too far. And I had to cross my heart that I'd be back on time if she'd just let me scoot out of her clutches for a few hours of freedom. She seemed happy to be rid of me, and once the train finally stopped moving, she threw me a quick nod and marched out the depot doors to take care of her detective work. She would never guess that I was doing my own. I sat down on a bench in the depot and ran my finger over the most important part of Gemma's last letter. Remember this part? He lives at the corner where two streets meet. One street is a number. The age your brother was when he died of scarlet fever. Oops, I had written dad died, sorry. The other is something I used to put in your hair to scare you. The first clue was easy to figure out. My brother Jeremiah died of the fever when he was 17. But as to figuring out the other street, well, there was a long list of things Gemma and I did as girls to scare each other. I slipped the letter back into my black bag and left the train station, crossing the busy road. The sign read Broad Street, so I followed it north into the city. Nobody seemed to care that I was a lady on my own, and I, and I kept my smile to myself so as not to draw unwanted attention. It felt good to be free and adventuring alone. I stopped by a general store and picked up two sassafras candy sticks for a penny to help me concentrate on Gemma's second clue. Yeah, candy to help her concentrate. Daisy chains, pine needles, mud, I mumbled to myself. Those were all things we put into each other's hair now and again. But to scare me, I fumbled for some coins to pay a newspaper boy. When I asked him to direct me towards 17th Street, he shoved a public ledger at me and pointed west with a gruff bark. Take a left turn at any of the next streets, lady. Tucking the newspaper into my bag, I glanced at the name of the nearest sign. Pine Street, it read. Didn't she say pine? Pine needles was something she said. Aha! I shouted. 17th and Pine Streets. This must be where Gemma's daddy lives. I walked to the corner, but something didn't add up. I watched a horse clip clop up the street, pulling a long wagon loaded with sacks of flour and other dry goods. There were no houses around here, just shops and businesses. And come to think of it, Gemma might have put pine needles in my hair, but that would hardly scare me. I decided to walk on, passing two more streets, Cypress and Spruce. I was about to lose hope amid all these tree names. So these are tree, Cypress, Spruce, Pine, okay? When a stranger told me the name of the next one, Locust Street, and that's when it hit me. Grasshoppers, I shouted, drawing strange looks from a few passerby. So locust is uh, similar to a grasshopper. All right, so grasshopper and 17th Street. What's going to happen next? End of the chapter.